My name is Sherry Conrad, and I am a Deaf Education and Training Specialist with RMTC DHH. I'm going to be monitoring the room this afternoon. Welcome to this one hour webinar titled Keeping It Fluent, Signed Reading Fluency. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Brent Bechtold from the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, where he works as a reading coach. We're so thankful that he's here presenting for us today. After the presentation is complete, we'll take some questions. You should all know a little bit about the Zoom environment before we begin. Today's webinar is being closed captioned. To see the closed captions, click the captions button in the Zoom menu and captions will appear along the bottom of your screen. Thank you, Ann Armstrong from Alternative Communication Services, ACS, for providing captions today. Thank you also to Katie Bechtold for voice interpreting our presentation. We want to make sure that everyone can contribute to the conversation. Even though your mic is muted, we want to hear your questions, comments, and thoughts. And we want you to interact with the others in the room. If you don't see the chat panel already, click the chat panel button in the Zoom menu and you can select specific attendees to chat with during the webinar. Above the field where you enter the text, you'll see a blue drop down menu. You should be able to select everyone if you want to communicate with everyone. You can also send private messages to individual participants. I will be monitoring the chat and dropping links to resources throughout this webinar. As we mentioned it in our email notifications, this e webinar is being recorded and it will be archived on the RMTC DHH TA Live webpage. As a reminder, we do request that you take a post survey for TA Live at the end of the session. We thank you in advance for contributing to our continued self-assessment self of the work. With all that business done, I want to welcome Brent. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to turn the session over to you. Thank you, Sherry. I appreciate that. Welcome and good afternoon. I hope you're excited and ready to learn more about fluency. I'm Brent Bechtold. I'm a reading specialist here at FSTB for the Deaf High School. First thing I want to pose to you a question is, what is fluency? And I'd like you to post in the chat box your thoughts about what fluency means. how fast you read, how quickly, how effortless you read, reading speed and accuracy. Anything else? Any other posts? Can read and comprehend what you are reading? Prosody, having word recall, accuracy with concepts while you're reading. Okay, good. That's a good start. It's interesting, many times fluency is ignored. It's one of the big five we talk about. We have phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, and fluency. And many teachers who don't feel comfortable teaching fluency, they kind of ignore that area and they go on with the others. So I'm going to show you today how important fluency is. It cannot be ignored. I wish we had more time because this should be an all-day workshop. I've taught this workshop before in an all-day setting. Um, after this webinar is finished, I strongly encourage you to read the International Literacy Association's writings on why reading fluency does it only mean reading speed and reading quickly. I want to take a moment now to talk about four different areas. I want you to read these very quickly. While you're reading, 
try to recognize what's missing from your definition that is shown here in the chart. Okay, you see the first column on the left, the National Reading Panel's definition from 2000. It's very brief. You see how short that is in relation to fluency. It talks about speed, accuracy, proper expression, and that's it. And then next column, you see Tim Rosensky's definition from 2014. He looked at fluency throughout his whole career and I first met him in 2014 at a reading conference. He was a speaker and he had been trying to figure out, I had been trying to figure out how to teach fluency better for seven years now. Uh, I was a teacher for seven years at that point and I was assistant principal for five years and now as a reading specialist for seven years. Um, I had asked teachers a while back, you know, what do you do with cold reads? How many words correct per minute? And when you're done with that, how do you assess, use that information to better assess and help the students improve when the teachers were sort of uncomfortable in their knowledge of that area and they just kind of would shelf that information once they had gathered it. And I realized that it was not something to be ashamed of. It was actually very helpful with our students who were deaf and deaf signers using ASL as our mode of communication. So I realized that we have to change. Uh, it was Tim who helped me realize that we have to change how we work with deaf students and how we teach the process for improving their fluency. That really had a great impact on me and I wanted to share that with you today. And his focus really is on automaticity, reading speed, and, um, but speed does not indicate is not the only indicator of authenticity and prosody. Which is expressiveness in reading. And then you see in the next column, Sue Rose's definition from the University of Minnesota, 2007. Her focus was on silent reading, fluency, oral signed reading, and fluency. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that too. And then the final column, Susan Easterbrook and Sandra Hudson proposed this definition and they developed these areas that they've looked at, which has greatly helped us understand reading fluency. We talked about accuracy, the, flu uh, the fluency envelope rather, visual grammar, accuracy, reading fluency. So all of that together um, is something that I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through our discussion. We'll be talking today about signed reading fluency, which includes automaticity, accuracy, prosody, chunking, the fluency envelope, and visual grammar. We'll also be talking about spoken reading fluency, which includes automaticity, accuracy, expression, and volume, phrasing, pace, and prosody. The third area is silent reading fluency, which includes automaticity, accuracy, and comprehension. Fluency is like the force, you know, in Star Wars, it's everywhere, it's all around us. So how can we improve that? We have to do that through practice. And I know many of you may have seen the movie starring Alex Honnold, the, uh, the movie titled Free Solo. He was the first climber to climb El Capitan in Yosemite National Park with no harness. He free solo, he free climbed that, a height of 3,200 feet, which sounds crazy and ridiculous. But what people don't know is that he practiced growing up. He had been practicing for this his whole life. At the age of five, he started climbing. At 10, he was climbing you know, weekly at a, a gym. As a teenager, he joined the state national and international competitions. 
So he wasn't the strongest or the best growing up, but he never gave up. He continued with his practice and worked harder and harder to gain those skills. And he studied this mountain. He didn't just do it one time. He would have fallen, of course, but he practiced with a harness, with ropes. He practiced without, he practiced parts without, and then he memorized his route, his path up to the top of the mountain. And then he was able to succeed in his endeavor. Now, I use this movie because as teachers, we give passages to students to read. And if we expect them to be an expert at fluency on their first try, that would be the same as expecting Alex Honnold to be able to scale um, El Capitan in Yosemite with no harness his first time. He had scaffolds and supports along his path to develop the fluency and reading is much the same. Okay, so we're gonna do a stop and jot activity looking for evidence of the seven C's for sign reading fluency. And you see our logo here is S3RF. We have the three here because this is talking about signed, spoken, and silent fluency. And so we practice signing, we don't practice, we practice signing we practice speaking, or we practice silent reading. We don't do a combination of any of those at the same time. So the seven C's are, have been developed. They're comfort, consistency, clarity, competence, and comprehension. That's, those are Tim Rosinski's five main C's. And then we've added two for chunking and conceptual sign accuracy to come up with these seven C's for sign reading fluency. And we have two videos I'd like to show you of a student here. The first one is his pre-video. He has not practiced this passage. This is his first time doing this cold read. And it's similar to what we did in the past, a one minute cold read, one time read to see how they did. Now, what I want you to watch for in this video is to find the evidence of the seven C's in the video. And I'm gonna pause after the first video um, and we, you'll see the passage. Oh, you can read the passage quickly first before the video. You notice the student finger spelling. Um, he doesn't know some signs for specific words. You can watch his facial expressions. You can see him kind of struggling, indicating that he doesn't know the meaning of some of the words. He's finger spelling and then he signed it correctly, but he kind of gave a shrug as if to say, I don't know what that means. You notice that he doesn't know what many of the words means. 
many of the words he signed something and then it looks similar to the word which is called a graph graphonic graphonemic error He said the sun shone for a week, but maybe the passage was saying it was a sun shower or it didn't shower for weeks. He said the clam or claim to fame. He said farm for fame. So many of the words look similar in print. Dirt and then he signed dirty and then he kind of shrugged. Seasoning, taste earlier, he, he used earthy, he signed earlier, early. Trust, look like truth. So in the chat, how many of you saw some of the seven C's? You can post your comments. Did you see consistency, confidence, clarity, chunking? conceptual sign accuracy. Did you see any of those seven C's? You can post your comments, yes or no. Thank you. Yeah, you didn't see many of the seven C's there. We were kind of looking at it. He was saying he became less confident as he went in. Yes, as he made more mistakes, his confidence decreased. He was kind of falling off the mountain there. He had no safety harness. So now let's look at the second video after the student had practiced this passage for a couple of weeks. And I want you to again look or evidence of the seven C's. Brent, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have had a request that the signing on the video be voiced over, please. Thank you. Okay, I can do that. Sorry. It's the same passage. While the video is running, I will voice interpret how the student is signing the passage. The title is Gross Out Greg. One day, our friend Greg, he started talking about doing gross things. He said he ate snot, he smelled dog poop, and didn't shower for weeks. He said, why, why is he famous? Why? Because of worm, he, the worm, he would put dirt seasoning on it and he would eat it. The worm tasted like earthy. We all paid attention to him. Some of us believed him. Some didn't. No one could be sure why, because no one had seen him. No one should have seen him do any of it. I had to know the truth. Okay, so. So the second time, you might have noticed that he, when he talked about the worm, he used a classifier and he talked about the dirt being on top of it and then showed the snot like this as the child ate it from the passage 
So it really under, shows his understanding of the passage. He talked about not showering for weeks. He didn't say only shower one week. He said he didn't shower for weeks. He said he became, he didn't use the substitute the sign farm for fame anymore. He had more confidence, you could see. He had more clarity. It wasn't a perfectly signed passage. And some people might point out his errors that he put Greg in space over here to his left at one point, and then he body shifted to the, to the right at one point. Um, so he might have made some body shift errors or body movement errors, like, like using the rope as a scaffold. So later we would see those errors work themselves out. But for now, he's learning how to do that, how to use the body shifting to show space. He didn't know that before, so it shows the improvement. So fluency for children who are deaf and hard of hearing and, and all children is tied to language. When they read a passage, they are connecting that passage. And with the deaf children, it's this much the same. They have to be able to code switch and take the English print and translate it to American Sign Language. So it's an important link. Uh, there isn't a link here to a PowerPoint that you could further read about that topic. The first time I saw Mr. Rosinski, it was at the second reading council of Florida in 2014. And he talked about how fluency is typically ignored. At the International Literacy Association Conference, he, which is published every year, he publishes this every year and talks about what's hot and what's not, what's popular in education at that time and what's not. And he said fluency is always on the not hot list. And that really bothered him. So he wrote this article about why fluency should be hot. So I, I highly recommend that you read that article. And it's, um, if you, this is just a little bit of surface information about it, but if you want more in depth reading about fluency, surface reading fluency, or deep reading fluency, you can read that article. So where does fluency fit? Richard Allington is a researcher who has done much study in fluency over the years. And he says that fluency is a bridge between comprehension and vocabulary. If you don't know the words, you can't cross the bridge to comprehension. Likewise, if you don't, you know, and it can go the other way too, vice versa. They're dependent upon each other. And a lot of students expend their energy decoding and trying to figure out the words. By the time they get to the end of the sentence, they can't make the connections about the words they've just read. And many people still hold the notion that fluency is just about speed reading, right? Automaticity, the ease with which you do something, is the best predictor for comprehension. Average reading speed rate for a 12th grader is only 150 words correct per minute. Um, that's not as fast as you would likely think. So we have to change our, we don't have to change our reading speed you know, it's like a, it's reading a tax form. You read that slowly, you don't understand it. If you, you have to read it again and again. Um, reading for pleasure, you might read faster. It depends on what you're reading. Um, other books that, uh, The Book Thief is the title that I've read. I read that book very, very slowly because I savored it. I didn't want it to be over. I really enjoyed that book. So reading speed depends on what you are reading. We've already talked a bit about prosody, voice expression in um, voice or ASL. And this is a great explanation 
Um, I want to watch this two minute clip from this TED talk. Um, this shows the connection between ASL and music. Um, the music part will hold on. I want to really focus on the ASL prosody that she talks about in this video. Or concept in ASL. This has captions. They're both highly spatial and highly inflected. Meaning that subtle changes can infect the entire meaning to both signs and sounds. I'd like to share with you a piano metaphor to have you have a better understanding of how ASL works. So envision a piano. ASL is broken down to many different grammatical parameters. If you assign a different parameter to each finger as you play the piano, such as facial expression, body movement, speed, hand shape, and so on as you play the piano, English is a linear language, as if one key is being pressed at a time. However, ASL is more like a chord. All 10 fingers need to come down simultaneously to express a clear concept or idea in ASL. If just one of those keys were to change the chord, it would create a completely different meaning. The same applies to music in regards to pitch, tone, and volume. In ASL, by playing around with these different grammatical parameters, you can express different ideas. For example, take the sign to look at. This is the sign to look at. I'm looking at you. Staring at you. Mm -hmm. Oof, busted. Uh-oh. What are you looking at? Aw, oh, stop. And then started thinking, what if I was... So the idea that ASL has many different parameters um, and can be one little change can have a big impact. So if you think about the old man in the boat, students sign that the first time and they say the old man in the boat what does that mean if you read that with expression you could think about the old people in the boat running the boat so when we read silently we want students to visualize what they're reading and that will help improve their prosody, both spoken and in ASL, and it will improve their comprehension. We have to build their word knowledge. We want to improve their comprehension, we have to build their word knowledge. And for those words to stick with the students, they have to read, write, say, sign a word many, many times. You have to talk about it many times. Um, they have to think about it. Sometimes a word can be shown, needed to be shown up to 15 times for some students. Some students need it 60, 70, 80 times, depending on their learning needs. The repeated exposure is a very part, important part. They can't just use the word one or two times. Word knowledge is needed for comprehension and connections. Now we have a video here that I'd like to show you that uses the example of prosody. First we have the caption with it and the second one has no caption. I will explain that for you. It doesn't have any words. And then the third one does have captions. So we'll go through each of these. The first one, it's showing if one word can rule them all. And the word is dude. So we're gonna show three different ways that those could be, those words could be used, whether it be surprise, frustration, saying hello, or winning around. Strange to me. Strange to me. 
here in Southern California. Southern California is where the word dude comes from. A bunch of word dude developed over the years. It's turned into a word. Strange bear in Southern California. Southern California is where the word dude comes from. A bunch of word dude developed over the years. It's turned into a word kind of like the Polynesian word aloha. You know, that's more than just one meaning. You can use it to say hello to people. Dude. <laughs> so, it's also used to mean listen or come here. Dude. <laughs> but it's most, most important meaning, though. Most important is you blew it. Dude. <laughs> it could also mean, are you in the closet with a knife? <laughs> okay, the second re video really has both characters and one has two and one and they're going back and forth. They're only saying one word. They're just saying the word dude over and over to each other. But notice their expression and how they're communicating with just the use of that one word. Okay, and the last video is a back and forth scenario. It says, I guess you have a point there, meaning, do you notice what they're going back and forth about? They're communicating with only one word. The last one's from a commercial. But I want you to notice what the word is and how that, how that word what. Hey, who are you? Oh, hey, Jeff, I'm a car thief. What? I'm here to steal your car because, well, that's my job. What? 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 <laughs> it happens. And you got cut rate car insurance? Paid for this? Could feel like getting robbed twice to get off stage. And you're better protected from me. <laughs> Okay, so you notice the importance of the expression and the prosody in each of the videos and the impact that it has. Fluency impacts signing also. Studies show that half of the scores from fluency students, I really wish we had more time so we could talk about this briefly, I'm just gonna cover this, but the model of fluency reading It's really uh, the f fact is that we need to be doing both modeling, signing stories and showing what meaning is, showing my thinking, sharing my thinking along the way, and then signing stories to them, modeling the language use without stopping, modeling a nice fluid fluency model for the students. And how do read alouds work with deaf hard of hearing students? We have to have both the English print and the ASL visible at the same time um, so that we can elaborate and provide expansions so that we can show style and content. We can do act out, acting out, and stepping into character to show action. A few more reasons why speed isn't everything. When you read, you might notice that we were also talking about accuracy, rate, prosody, comprehension, and motivation. For deaf students, they're doing a lot of translating between the a English print and the ASL. So their speed might be slower, but they will make those gains once comprehension is there. Many students have said before, no, oh, I already read that. I read that one time. I don't have to read that again. You have to have many repeated readings for the seven C's to begin to develop. You notice that first student video that we looked at a few minutes ago, the comment was that the, not many of the seven C's were seen. And then 
after he had read that for 10 minutes every day for a week or two, he had had time with it and practiced it, he was ready to do his final video recording. And academic vocabulary, words like get, I, I sat down and I read with the student and he said, get dark. And I said, well, is, you know, is that conceptually accurate? That's kind of the wrong concept, the way he had signed it as two separate English signs. Um, or to get angry. It doesn't mean you're actually receiving something. It means your feeling of anger is increasing. And another one said, what would you do when, what will you do when you get there? And it was kind of like, oh, fig he figured out, oh, that means what we do when you arrive at that place. Fluency is like everything. You must have a lot of practice it. A lot of practice 10,000 10, hours to develop fluency. And there's one of my favorite quotes that says the greats weren't great because at birth, because they could paint, they were great because they painted a lot. One of our former students um, was a motocross racer here from the school. And she had been racing since the age of three. She had started on a motorbike with training wheels. She went on to win national world championships, gold medals, all of these accolades. And she lived and breathed motocross racing every day of her life. She also wrote a book. And if you think about the 10,000 hour rule divided by school that comes out to about four, 14 years, that comes out to about four hours per day that she was practicing. So we need more than the time that we have to practice. Even after students graduate, they should continue practicing this. And we don't practice until we get it right, we practice until we can't get it wrong. There's one quote that I'd like to share with you. For assisted reading, like scaffolding, that is a great um, thing to do with the students. And I'd show you this video of a dog falling down the stairs to illustrate that. Oh, it's okay. Come on. I'll show you, see? First, he's showing the way. Okay, we'll show her again. Modeling. We'll show her. Going up, showing it again. <laughs> oh my God, I like <laughs> stuff so there. He's afraid, he doesn't want to try. He's thinking, you know, where's my safety harness? Where's my support? Now he's looking for another escape. Modeling, breaking it down into smaller spots. Modeling again. You see, one time of modeling is not enough. And finally, he's able to build up the confidence to try. And you see the extra support that he's getting. And they won't let him go. He gets the support he needs. Now, cat might be a different story. It's funny. And he has no safety harness now. <laughs> So there's different kinds of support for reading. Many think that choral reading can't be successful with deaf students, but it can. Finding in a group as together doing choral reads, partner reading, audio or video assistance with reading, 
I'm signing, you're watching me. That's a turn taking echo scenario for reading as a mother support. Show how that works. Wazinski researched wide plus deep positive transfer. And we want all of our students reading in a variety of genres and different types of books. And if they're only reading at a surface level for each one, it's not enough. They have to do some deep reading too some close reading of passages that they do over and over, repeated readings. So that will carry over to the next passage that we're going to talk about and we're going to discuss the chart. Um, with one time of reading, they get this level of comprehension, a minimal level of comprehension, and then they add another reading passage and it might be similar. And then if they add another passage, it might move them up. So some of these might, their reading level might remain the same. And when they do the deep readed and repeated reads, you might see them grow. They did it one time and then they read it again and they grew in their comprehension and their comprehension continued to grow. And then when they got to a new passage, you would notice the difference that it was higher than A, higher than the first time they had tried it and they would continue growing from there. So then when they had a new passage at the other level of C, you'd have A, B, and C, and then they would keep going up from there. So many times that will help to improve their comprehension um, because that can impact the scale if meaning more than one year's growth with visual learning and it's been found to have 0.67 impact, level of impact. I wanna briefly show you these two videos. This is a student who did a pre-reading video in the fall and then did 12 rounds of pre and post signing and working on this passage, and I want to show you the growth that the student made. Mm -hmm. Do I have to share with you so that we can see it? Yes. That was all right. 
Okay, we'll have to hold that. I can send you that link later. Um, I should, it was ready up on my computer, but I was using a different computer for the presentation. Sorry about that. One thing that can also help students motivate to be motivated to improve is performance. When they read something again and again, if it's boring or dry content or it's dull passages, they're not motivated to want to read it again and again. Poetry is a motivating thing to read. Um, theater, dialogue, monologues, presentations, different types like that. And I have two examples here to show you of things that really motivated students to improve their fluency. One is Let It Go, and then um, we'll watch the next one. Um, but briefly, the first video um, I want to show you is one of our students signing a song. And she won this for our pageant. Um, I took the video from there, and then I added the words to the song so that you can see the text and the ASL presentation of it. Do you think she practiced it? It's impossible that she would have just done this one time. I asked her teacher for dance troupe, and she said she probably practiced that 40, 50, maybe up to 100 times. She practiced it many, many times before she was ready for her performance. And it's much the same with fluency in reading. So we want to develop a gradual release of responsibility with the students. Um, we do first, I do, you watch. We do a lot of modeling. You do, or I do, and you help. Um, we do readings together. And then we do practicing with peers, or you two do, and I help. I, you do, and I watch. We do video. We don't have time to show all of that now in a hands-on situation we would in an elementary classroom show you how we do teach rhythm and how rhythm and can impact sign. Um, the intervention, the need for improvement greatly helps with confidence and readiness, and I'm hoping that these two videos will work because I'd like for you to see those. I noti notice when you watch uh, below the video and above the movie, you'll see the practice. The, there are two different segments there. watch his expressions on the top video. And the other one shows the student, and you'll notice the impact of speed. Notice what happens in the pre-video, compare it with the post-video. The pre is on the bottom and the post is on the top. Remember, look for the seven C's as you watch. See the tongue out there moving with when he signed the word help.
he's looking, he didn't know the word, the girl didn't know the word. Notice on top, he was already ahead, it was faster, more fluent. She's looking over the teacher, smiling, excited, feeling very confident. He's more expressive in the video on top. Notice the girl using repetition of a sign. That's fine because in the story, it was repeated. And you can see the smiling, but on the bottom, she was still just signing. She hadn't caught up yet. The speed had increased with confidence and comprehension. And you can use any passage for their fluency, but use something at their independent reading level, not above. Something with such as 80, 90% accuracy, accuracy is fine. We have an adapted rubric from two ladies. That they researched everything and put together all of this information um, but they eliminated some things and then we used what fit um, and adapted the rubric. We did make some additions and deletion, uh, deletions with their permission um, to help our make, make our rubric more suitable. You notice we have it in columns, pre and post. And when it's filled out, we circle where their scores are the first time they do their video, their pre-video in the blue, the cold read, and the second time in the red is their practiced reading, their repeated reading. And there's two in types with the fluency envelope. We focus on speed and expression, body movement, signing space, sign movement, finger spelling, And then visual grammar includes the visual space where the student uses indexing and the space around them. Roll shift to show characters. Eye gaze, if the father were talking to a son, the eye gaze might come from above and then it might shift from below when the son talks back. Negation, if they were to say they don't, a head shake or negation to indicate not wanting something. Action, use of classifiers. Same as we talked about before, the boy using a uh, classifier to show the actions of the worms and show how the dirt was sprinkled on the worm and that kind of thing. Um, pronominalization using pronouns, showing where the pronouns would be, he fell in love with her, and so forth. There's more examples um, within the presentation for you. You can see the, what's circled in blue and what's circled in red. You can see the growth and what activities were done. It's important to note the process. First, they are video doing their cold read. They circle the words they don't know. They practice those words. They learn that vocabulary. They practice chunking the print, like the words half to, um, producing those as one sign movement to in, uh, show the concept, practicing signing it in ASL until they're ready to sign it again and do their post-test post-reading to show the comparisons. 
So I know it's already three o'clock. Um, I guess we have a moment for questions, if you have any. I know um, some of the videos weren't shared uh, properly. Um, we will make sure that those are made accessible, accessible to you. And um, we will do this presentation again at the FEDHH conference. Um, so please, at the FEDA conference, so please, um, I'll be there doing this live in person. So if you had any questions or comments at that time, um, you could come and approach me them. We also have Pineapple PD videos in the works that we will be releasing. We'll be doing all of that soon. So there's many different ways that we can follow up and provide more resources. I'm happy to answer questions via email too. Brent, we have a question. Do you have any word lists that you recommend or what about the fry phrases? Depending upon which level the student's working at. Um, RTI has free, high frequency word lists um, you could use. It's important if the student does not have enough sight words, like at level one, level one words, then they would have to learn and practice those first before they could begin working on their fluency. And then they would be developing that academic vocabulary more and move up to level two. It's really important to practice that initial vocabulary and sight words so that they can see those words in context, not only in isolation. This is re reading the words in isolation is important, but it's not only having them memorized that's key. You need to see them in context. Any other questions? We have some other comments about um, using like Fairview word learning or Fairview learning word lists with signed videos of multiple meaning words and um, that Pineapple PD is going to be doing a Pineapple University about the S3RF. So we're excited and we'll make sure that we get that announced out to everyone. Yes. And I'm going to drop some. Shows that any, with many words, it's really important that they see the words in context and that when they look at that, that they are able to determine the meanings. You know, if they were to try different meanings in that word, kind of like a closed activity where they would replace the meaning in the sentence to see if it matched the context. That's a good strategy to practice too. Karina says in the chat that she watched a video that says that learning to read for kids who are profoundly deaf is like learning a ton of phone numbers for um, folks that are hearing. If you don't hear the phonemes associated with the sounds of words and you're just relying on visually memorizing all the words, yes. Um, um, I did forget to mention that during the pre-videos, it's very important if the student is seeing a word that they don't know that they don't skip it. Fingerspell that word, practice fingerspelling the word because fingerspelling is connected to fluency. Research is showing that Fingerspelling and fluency are connected to comprehension. That is the beginning of being able to comprehend that word. So it's very important. Language itself is most important. If they don't have access to language growing up, then obviously reading will be a struggle. It will be a challenge. Um, think about, you know, students who arrived to school with a 30 million word gap here some hearing students arrived to school that far behind so then if you think about our deaf and hard of hearing students on top of that who knows how big the language deprivation is how big the gap is there they might be 60 million words behind who knows so obviously um comprehension and, and language are key kara brought up a good point as a um as a follow-up to what you just said brent Next week on Monday and Tuesday at FSDB, RMTC and FSDB are collaborating to bring fingerspelling our way to reading, um, yes. which is a really great opportunity. We actually still have seats left. So if someone wants to get in on oh, that, get in on that. Um, and so are, if there are, are there any other questions?
I don't see any more questions in the chat right now. Um, Brent, we did want to thank you so much for being here today. And thank you so much to Katie for interpreting. It was so, some really amazing information. Um, we would also like to take this time to thank our CART provider, Ann Armstrong, from, our, from Alternative Communication Services for providing our captions today. We would ask that you join us next month on November 13th when we host Dr. Jennifer Catalano from Flagler College as she presents Keeping It Explicit, Explicit Contextualized Vocabulary Instruction for Students Who Are DHH or ECV DHH. Finally, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of your day today. The recording will be posted on the RMTC website. We love hearing from you and we're happy to help in any way we can. You can connect with us through social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can also sign up for our newsletter. We would love your comments on social media about what you learned, but make sure you use the hashtag RMTCDHH, hashtag DefEd, and hashtag FLDefEd. As you may know, we are a Florida Department of Education, Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services discretionary project and all of the services we provide are at no cost to the attendees. To continue our work, we have to collect survey data to justify why our services are needed. If each of you could please complete the survey right now, we would greatly appreciate it. We'll drop that link in the box, in the chat box. If you had a colleague who missed this broadcast or you want to rewatch it later, head on over to rmtcdhh.org forward slash TA hyphen live. Thank you again on behalf of all of the RMTC DHH staff. We will be ending the broadcast now. Thank you, Brent. Thank you.